What can I say about Super Mario 64? That hasn't already been said before. <laughs> Who knows? And I don't give a sh anyways. Super, Super Mario, Mario 64. 64 was released in 1996 as a launch title for the Nintendo 64. And like its 2D forefather Super Mario Brothers, it's one of the most important and influential video games of all time. Nintendo has this knack for creating masterpieces and repeatedly setting the bar higher and higher for the entire gaming industry. <laughs> Whoops. Other third-person action games at the time either featured tank controls, similar to early Resident Evil titles, which aren't preferable for general navigation, or were well-crafted but extremely linear. Never before had a 3D platformer been executed so flawlessly. Which is surprising, honestly. Don't get me wrong, uh, Nintendo were, and still are, uh, very talented developers. But not only were they taking a tremendous risk with the transition from 2D to 3D, they decided to completely rethink what goals, objectives, and power-ups would look like. No longer are players just moving from left to right to reach an end goal. We now have entire open world areas to explore. It's just... It's just a little different. Presumably to save on that primitive N64 cartridge space, the game only features 15 main stages and 9 smaller courses. That's just... 24 levels. When comparing this to Super Mario World's 96, it seems meager. Until you realize Super Mario Land only had 12. <laughs> This being the premier 3D Mario experience, you'd hope Miyamoto spent some time focusing on how the game feels when you pick up this spaceship of a controller. And apparently, uh, that's exactly what he did. Rumor has it, Mario started off as a simple block, and Miyamoto refused to move forward with the project until he and the team made controlling just that little block fun. If true, that's some dedication. Mario moves like butter in this game. He's also received a widely expanded moveset, featuring backflips, long jumps, side flips, forward dives, jump kicks, punches, triple jumps, slide kicks, wall kicks, crawling, and even break dancing. Yeah, don't fuck with this guy. We had, what, in Super Mario World? <laughs> Jumping and spin jumps? <laughs> Put that pacifier in your mouth, Mario. We ain't playing baby games no more. One thing I will say, for those of you Nintendo Switch first-timers, Control is not quite as solid. Because of its design, the 64 joystick had a much tighter, what they call, dead zone, which allows for more precise plumber movement. This leaves the 3D All-Stars port feeling twitchy at times when accuracy is required. Two areas I immediately noticed this were when flying and aiming the cannon. And were future entries more precise? Sure. But coming back to Super Mario 64 after all these years is surprisingly unclunky. At least on the movement side of things. That's called foreshadowing. Let's go. Somewhere along the way during development, Nintendo decided, mm, yeah, Super Mario 64 is gonna be its own thing. My guess is, this happened right around the time they realized creating 100 distinct levels was going to be an impossibility in both a workload and cartridge space sense. But man, what they landed on was complete magic. Dear Mario, please come to the castle. I have baked a cake for you. Yours truly, Princess Toadstool. Peach. Bowser's taken Peach again. No way, I can't believe it. I refuse to believe it. But this time, he's hiding within the walls of her castle, which the player gets to explore in a 3D space for the first time ever. Turns out it's loaded with otherworldly portals, hidden through paintings and other means. It's so easy to become absorbed in Super Mario 64 as its own unique experience that you almost forget there aren't even fire flowers or mushrooms. Okay, there's one-up shrooms, but those don't count. In fact, all the power-ups featured here hadn't been used in any previous Mario game. I mean, I guess you could say the star returned, but not in the same capacity. Instead of shrinking when damaged, Mario now has a health bar that can be replenished by grabbing coins, spinning hearts, or resurfacing from water. Oh. Uh. 
What's wrong, babe? I think I have cancer. Uh-oh. Wait. Actually, now I'm feeling pretty good. It cannot be overstated how much of a welcome departure perusing the castle is from simply selecting levels in a basic overworld. This feels super dated compared to this. But exploring the hub world wouldn't be any fun without a load of secrets waiting inside. From fake dead ends, to hidden alcoves, to pools of metal, each containing their own miniature worlds, Super Mario 64 consistently surprises with how seriously it takes its mysteries. Every floor seemingly adds a twist to the formula, with the first comprised mainly of basic, easy-to-find painting worlds. But the basement ramps it up by pretending it houses only one level, when in reality, two more are hiding in unique locations along with a puzzle that needs to be solved. This gets capped off in the upper floor Floors, where Nintendo takes it one step further by adding multiple stages where the environment is dictated by how and where players enter them. Each room is gated off with a different star count, presumably so players can learn certain skills or abilities before tackling harder levels. A good example of this is the very first star, a big bob -omb on a summit. Mario spawns at the base of bob -omb Battlefield, where a dirt path and bridges lead him all the way up to King bob -omb. There's even cute little signs in case you get lost. When approached, the crowned cannonball says to beat him, you have to pick him up from the back and hurl him. Listen, I know I'm a dummy, but can you stop holding my hand, please? Stop that! Well, turns out, th this first boss battle is setting players up for Mario's first Bowser encounter. And his second. And third. <sighs> we won't get into that right now. Each course has seven stars to attain. Six main stars, and an extra one if you happen to collect 100 coins. If I could offer a suggestion for a possible future fix for 100 coin stars, thank you. Maybe have them spawn in a designated area instead of simply on top of Mario's exact location. I'll never forget when I accidentally collected 100 coins on the slide in Cool Cool Mountain. It appeared I couldn't grab it as I was sliding, and upon re-entering the slide again to grab my prize, it was gone. I had unintentionally broken the 100 coin challenge and had to restart the level. Each of the six main stage stars comes with a clue attached to it before Mario enters a level. Remember Big bob on the summit? Players know they're looking for a large black ball and he's going to be located somewhere high. Most of the time, these hints before entering a level are great pointers that allow each instance to feel like a mini scavenger hunt. But every once in a while, a little turd peeks its head out. One of the most notorious is Blast Away the Wall, where players have to use a cannon to shoot a random piece of geometry in Thwomp's Fortress. While figuring out the cannon is used for this star isn't too difficult. You know, the blast and all that. There's nothing to signify this specific section needs hit. Fall onto the caged island could possibly be even worse. A star rests in a hovering cage which seems impossible to access. You can't really just jump in and get it. You can't jump off the top of the tower to reach it. There's no switches or levers to pull. You want to know what you have to do? Find this random ass owl that only resides in this specific tree and use it to fly awkwardly above the cage and drop down onto it. I, I, I really don't know. Thank God I got the Prima Strategy Guide for this one. A majority of what I like to call intro stars for each level actually task Mario with exploring a large chunk of said world. Go on a ghost hunt has players entering all rooms of the Boo Mansion to kill ghosts. Bored Bowser's sub has you swimming all the way through the level to simply nab a star on top of the submarine. Scale the Mountain features Mario climbing all the way to the top of Tall Tall Mountain. The, the, the list goes on. This strategy of exploring the vast majority of a level right off the bat is genius as it not only familiarizes users with their surroundings, but will most likely have them curious to visit sections they may have overlooked. 
Each of the five first floor stages have this neat feature where they tell a story if you choose to tackle their objectives linearly. Once plunder in the sunken ship is completed and water drains from the vessel, every other star selected in Jolly Roger Bay now features the Black Pearl floating above water. I especially enjoy the tale of bob Battlefield, where two rolling cannonballs are joined by a third once King bob is defeated. <laughs> Damn. That's pretty fucked up. When Mario's collected enough stars, he can enter Bowser levels in each separate area of the castle. These are fun platforming gauntlets the plumber has to tackle before his turtle confrontation. While the stages are always a blast to play through and even feature separate red coin challenges within them, uh, the Bowser fights at the end are pretty uninspired. In a possible nod to Super Mario Bros. 1, each Bowser fight unfolds in essentially the same way. Grab him by the tail, throw him into a bomb. It's disappointing to see the team on top of their craft in so many different aspects, but drop the ball in such a major area. I'll never forget 10-year-old me thinking, That was it? After my second Bowser encounter, hoping and praying the next would up the ante in some way, only to have you throw him into three separate bombs this time around. One subject I've always been really torn on. <laughs> Get it? Torn? Let's discuss power-ups. The typical hovering bricks Mario Smash to get coins and other goodies are mysteriously missing in Mario 64. They've been replaced with see-through blocks that become solid whenever certain secret switches are pressed. Not too dissimilar from Super Mario World. Cool throwback. Once solid, these three block colors form Mario's core power-up lineup. We have the wing cap, which lets Mario fall with style, a metal cap which all but replaces the traditional star power-up but comes with the added benefit of sinking him in water, and the vanish cap, making him invisible which allows for running through certain walls and other objects. The wing cap sees the most use of these three. Gee, I wonder why that is. You can tell Nintendo tried to tone down the flying aspect for balance purposes. It's, it's really more like advanced hovering than flying. But jumping off a high point in any stage can allow huge chunks of otherwise meaningful platforming to be completely glossed over. Kind of reminds me of another item in Mario's arsenal. Nice. Implementation for both the Vanish and Metal Caps are kind of half-baked. Commonly mitigated to the passing through of one-off walls or sinking to grab a quick red coin or star. Challenges built around these power-ups almost always come off as filler content rather than well-thought-out, engaging ideas. I always think of how fun it would be if Nintendo provided an on and off button while in vanish state so they could create crazy jumping sections where players had to continually choose whether they needed transparency or solidity. Metal Mario also moves the the same as normal, Mario? Bruh, aren't you like two tons of pure steel? Now, make these caps distinct. How about a slower, more lethargic move speed for Metal Mario and throw them in situations with tons of hazards and difficult jumps required to reach a star? Shoot, and I haven't even mentioned time limits. Instead of the traditional method of losing your power up when damaged, Mario 64 opts to have each of them on a time limit. Huh. Time limitations in Mario are usually reserved for more powerful items. And in 64, power ups are so busted they're all timed. While I understand Nintendo primarily wanting to house specific challenges for these, it's a shame none exist that can be carried between levels. With Mario 64 being the very first in the franchise to allow user inputted camera action, Nintendo felt the need to contextualize it in a cute way, as they do. So here we have Lakitu, your cameraman that'll be following the plumber throughout his journey. Look at him. Instead of a spiny, he's got a camera. <laughs> 
die. Only problem is, this means your third-person view of Mario is now a tangible, real-world object that only moves in 90-degree increments, gets continuously caught on surfaces, forces you to approach obstacles from odd angles as it'll refuse to move at inopportune times for seemingly no reason? But worst of all, completely change viewpoints mid-jump? Which... How am I supposed to even react to this? Thankfully, a majority of the game takes place in these wide, open environments, so the camera isn't given an endless amount of chances to ruin your day. Which, I'm sure, was an intentional move made by Nintendo. But even with all my complaining, I still think the camera works surprisingly well for, you know... Setting the industry standard? Now, all these are issues that could have been fixed in the Switch re-release by the offering of 360-degree camera control movement via the secondary joystick, but we're instead stuck with the same C-stick button controls lazily converted to work with a joystick. A big issue in the Nintendo 64 era was draw distance. And with any console having limited resources to work from, cuts have to be made somewhere. I mean, we aren't just viewing the action from a static sideways viewpoint anymore. Mario can now bring the camera in behind his head to see far away objects. But here's a good example for you. Look at these coins disappear and reappear as I approach them. No, nope, Johnny don't like that! Not even the surfaces Mario uses to navigate these stages are safe from popping. This can be a bit bothersome, as Super Mario 64 tasks players with collecting 100 coins on each of its 15 stages to earn an extra star. And there's no way to know if there's coins in a certain location from simply looking from a decent distance. Thankfully, Nintendo still allows red coins to be viewed from a mile away, but players have to do a little extra unnecessary legwork for their brethren. Let's go. Guys, okay, 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 hear me out for a second. Charles Martinet. In all this excitement, I almost forgot. It's me, Mario. Super Mario 64 introduced Mario's voice for the first time. And let's be honest, they couldn't have chosen a better candidate than Charles. All Mario's voice clips in this game are so crisp. So many iconic lines. We got Let's A Go, Yahoo, So Long Gay Bowser. Wait, what? Bye bye! So long, Gay Bowser! Much better. Another area this game shines is its soundtrack. Mario's original composer, Koji Kondo, is at the helm yet again, smashing out bangers left and right. real issue is, some stages feature repeat tracks. This is a holdover from the previous 2D titles, and it's a shame. Each stage having its own tune would have added to its unique identity, especially since you enter each one at least six different times. Now I made all those previous critiques so I could end here. Super Mario 3D All-Stars is the most blatant, low-effort cash grab since Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. Rewind the clock to 1993. Nintendo releases the INCREDIBLE Super Mario All-Stars for Super Nintendo, which features four NES classics. Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, 3, and Lost Levels, the previously Japan-exclusive original sequel to Super Mario Bros. 1. So yeah, it was a huge deal. Including all four of these gems would have been a neat release in and of itself, but Nintendo took it one step further. Each game has been completely remastered in the graphic and music departments. This elevated Super Mario All-Stars into the stratosphere, and is some people's preferred way to play these titles. Then we have 3D All-Stars. <sighs> 
Um, is there a difference? We'll get to Sunshine and Galaxy another time, but I'd like to point you, my fabulous viewer, to Banjo-Kazooie. Another Nintendo 64 treasure that was in dire need of an update. Well, guess what? It got exactly that. Rareware fully recreated it on the Xbox 360 back in 2008. 2008. Keeping its original polygonal art style, the enhancement included reworked textures, UI elements, widescreen enhancement, full HD support, and even fixes to some of the game's more inherent issues like frame rate and draw distance. Draw distance. Why does that sound so familiar? I know a lot of people were looking for a remaster on the level of Super Mario Odyssey, but I'd be perfectly happy with a treatment closer to what Banjo received. So while I'm happy I now have a convenient place to play three iconic platformers, let's be honest, Super Mario 64 deserved way better. From levels changing forms, being hidden in creative ways, and morphing based on the way a painting is entered, it's apparent Mario Team was at the tip top of their game during 64's development. They were able to make a myriad of changes, but still have the experience feel distinctly Mario, through the brilliant use of creativity, color, and fun. It is disappointing Super Mario 64 doesn't have a better end game. After collecting all 120 stars, Mario can finally use the cannon outside to access the castle roof and meets Yoshi! who grants him 100 lives, then promptly vaults to his death. <laughs> the devs make a note in his dialogue, reminding players to keep playing. Maybe I can use this time to collect all the stars that I haven't gotten yet. Oh, wait. At least I got my sparkle jump. No, but seriously, how about a painting conveniently located on the back of the castle, which contains an insanely difficult but rewarding secret stage to cap off the whole experience? But even without all that, Mario 64 is an undeniable classic that firmly nestles its way into the gaming requirements before you die checklist of video games. Play it. And with that, I think I'll leave you. With the incredibly basic model Mario becomes when action's moving way too fast or he's too far away from the camera that I didn't even notice until I finally played this game in higher definition. Enjoy.